Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about the hottest planet in the solar system, Venus. But more specifically, we're going to discuss the possibility of life here, especially based on some of the more recent studies. So imagine an object that is so extremely hot, acidic and filled with so much pressure that even the toughest Soviet probe only survived here for like 2 hours max. As a matter of fact, that probe was able to take a picture that sort of looks like this after processing. So this is Venus, the hell of the solar system. How could we talk about life possibly existing here? Well, um, when the Soviets discovered that the temperatures and pressures and the acidity here was just too extreme, they more or less abandoned further missions. They realized that no life will probably be found here. But in 1963, Carl Sagan wrote a very interesting paper proposing that even though on the surface of Venus there might be no life, we could potentially find something in Venusian atmosphere. And he even identified a region in the Venusian atmosphere that is currently referred to as the habitable zone of Venus. This habitable zone is anywhere between 47 to about 70 kilometers of altitude and essentially it's the region where we can technically expect temperatures and pressures very similar to those right here on Earth. Anywhere between minus 20 to about 65 degrees Celsius with pressures um, of about one atmospheric pressure and the only problem being, well, a lot of acid, acidic clouds more specifically. But that never really stopped some of the bacteria here on Earth. As a matter of fact, in one of the recent videos I talked about the extreme waters and lakes of Dalol's volcano, which um, have some of the highest acidity possible actually, it's basically pH of zero, and very high temperatures and also a lot of acidity. And many lakes here do have life. Some don't, but many do. And this suggests that some of the more extreme bacteria could technically survive in those upper layers of uh, Venusian atmosphere. And the thing is, there are a lot of signs pointing at some unusual strange activity in the Venusian atmosphere. More specifically, we have recently discovered what seems to be climatic changes or basically something equivalent to, I guess, seasons of uh, Venusian atmosphere, where the temperature and also most importantly these unusual patches do change in size um, depending on the year. And today many scientists actually think that the unusual dark patches that have been observed inside the atmosphere, or the so-called dark UV absorbers as they're also known, could maybe be caused by some sort of a bacterial organism that is absorbing the UV light and is using it for its life purposes. In other words, there is currently a lot of scientists believing that Venusian life could actually exist in the upper atmosphere. Now, this would not really be a surprise because we do have bacteria living in our atmosphere and even upper atmosphere, while at the same time, even though technically Venus currently looks like this, this is a composite shot taken by the Venera missions uh, back in the 70s, once upon a time, we think Venus looked very much like Earth. It had oceans, it had very likely a lot of atmosphere, possibly oxygen, and for all we know, it may have had life. And if some of that life survived, it could now be thriving in the Venusian upper atmosphere. And so the most recent study assumed that there could be life here and decided to investigate if it can survive other dangerous to life phenomena such as for example the cosmic rays that strike Earth and of course Venus from every single direction. So we know that cosmic rays and radiation can easily destroy life and because it comes not just from the Sun but also from the um, actual space around us, it could destroy any life that is trying to survive in Venusian atmosphere if there is a lot of radiation there. But because Venus has such a thick atmosphere uh, and because it's so close to the Sun, it generates this unusual phenomenon known as the induced magnetosphere, sort of by accident. Basically, uh, when the solar wind, because of its power close to the Sun, strikes Venusian thick atmosphere, it creates charged particles which then cause Venus to have a little bit of magnetosphere, but possibly enough to protect some of the life if it exists in the atmosphere. And so the scientists behind this recent paper that you can find in the description below decided to investigate, assuming that life is in the atmosphere, would it survive the radiation? And they decided to look at bacteria such as this bacteria right here, which survives in really extreme environments. This bacteria is known as Shevanella onaidensis and it's very interesting to science because 
It doesn't seem to need oxygen or a lot of other materials to survive. It can thrive in metallic or sulfur rich environments. And it can also even uh, help us extract some of the metals if we ever decide to go and explore other worlds. But the most interesting part about it here is that it could easily survive in the conditions of the so-called habitable zone in Venusian atmosphere. The only other danger to this bacteria would be radiation coming from cosmic rays. And if it can technically survive the cosmic rays, there would be almost no reason for us to assume that something in the Venusian atmosphere could destroy bacterial life. And by analyzing various conditions and various doses of radiation, the scientists behind this paper basically came to a conclusion that there is not enough radiation in the Venusian habitable zone to harm Shawanella onidensis. In other words, most bacteria similar to this one would easily survive in the Venusian atmosphere and despite acidic clouds would very likely thrive in those conditions. There's a lot of material there, there's a lot of sulfur, there's a lot of what would be equivalent to bacterial food and any bacteria that's present in the atmosphere of Venus could definitely adapt to these conditions and even use the UV light coming from the sun for its own purposes, which is maybe what we're observing with these strange unexplained UV dark patches that scientists have been witnessing in the last few years. So far there's really no explanation, no chemical explanation for what we're observing, but many scientists believe that maybe a bacterial colony of an extremely large size could explain what we're seeing. Essentially Venusian life, but not on a surface, in the clouds. And interestingly, the Venera missions and also the Magellan and Pioneer missions that came to Venus roughly around 40 years ago discovered a lot of interesting materials here that are used by life here on Earth. For example, the Magellan mission discovered different types of carbonyl sulfides. We also discovered a lot of hydrogen sulfides, uh, sulfur dioxide, and all of these materials are used here on Earth by life to produce energy. And so there's no reason for us to believe that Venus is incapable of also hosting life, but slightly different from life on Earth. Now unfortunately no major mission is really being planned to Venus anytime soon, and the only currently functioning probe uh, around Venus is the Japanese Akatsuki that is currently mapping and exploring the Venusian atmosphere in a little bit more detail. It's also trying to discover any kind of sign of lightning, for example, and hasn't really seen anything. It seems like there's no lightning on Venus. But anyway, that's something we'll talk about in some of the future videos. What is important though is that we don't have any missions planned to try to discover if what we're seeing on Venus is life. Because there might be alien life very close to Earth, the closest planet to Earth, Venus. But currently we're really just planning missions to Mars and not Venus. Although interestingly last year NASA awarded about $120,000 to one of the teams to try to develop something similar to what you see on the screen. A kind of an autonomous flying drone that would stay in the atmosphere and try to discover something alive. But the thing is this is still in really early planning stages so it would probably be at least a decade before we develop anything equivalent to an actual mission. For now, we only have Akatsuki and its beautiful pictures. But anyway, what's important from all of these studies is that there are clear signs that something is going on in the atmosphere of Venus and all of these signs point at bacterial life. Unusual life that seems to affect the atmospheric conditions on Venus and also seem to visually change the appearance. And if we're lucky, in the next few years, we might discover what exactly is causing this. But until then, that is all I wanted to mention in this video. Let's finish this video on this beautiful image of so-called Mat Mons, the 8 km high volcano, the image for which was created by the Magellan mission many decades ago. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be discussing a somewhat interesting idea that was published back in 1990 in Nature magazine. The idea that there seems to be a bit of a correlation between every time the sun itself reaches solar maximum, when it has the highest number of sunspots and thus produces the most amount of solar wind, and the occurrence of flu pandemics on the planet. And they do actually provide an interesting explanation to all of this. But is it true though? So seeing a graph like this actually does make you question things a little bit. Here, what you're looking at is of course various pandemics including the uh, Spanish flu right here 
Some other pandemics that occurred throughout the history with some of the bigger ones being this here known as Asian and this one here being the Hong Kong, each of which ended up killing over a million people. And usually coinciding with the solar maxima, it does make you question if there is some sort of a relationship we're not seeing. So this short article was published in Nature magazine back in 1990 and was essentially talking about how there is actually possibly a relationship between solar winds, which are usually identified by the amount of solar spots on the sun, and essentially the appearance of pandemic or basically the increase of infections around the planet. And the main explanation being that there are a lot of viruses in the upper atmosphere that the solar wind itself pushes down closer to the surface of the planet, thus increasing the chances for infection and increasing the chance for a pandemic. So in some sense, um, even though it does sound like a far-fetched theory, it's sort of still interesting to investigate if it is, because there are a lot of things here that do make sense. So first of all, let's talk about viruses. A lot of really beautiful virus art is actually made by this wonderful person, David uh, Goodsell. Here's actually what his coronavirus looks like. And the reason I wanted to start here is because we don't really know that much about viruses, specifically their origin. There are suggestions that they may have come from outer space, and we'll talk more about this in one of the future videos. But there are also suggestions that these were originally the building blocks of other life on our planet. There's a lot of evidence to support this. And we also know for a fact that there are a lot of viruses present in the DNA of pretty much every organism on the planet, including humans. You can check out some of the previous videos I made where I explained that viral DNA is present inside of us and is actually responsible for some of the more fundamental functions in our body. There are also a lot of viruses, way, way more than anything else on the planet, and a lot of them are very, very different from one another and also from other life on the planet. We've also very recently discovered a virus that is completely different from everything else, although I think this deserves its own video. So there's basically, in a nutshell, a lot of things we don't understand about viruses. We just know that there are many of them. We know that they depend on other cells for basically creating more copies of themselves, so they do need life and more specifically cells from different types of life to essentially procreate and create more copies. But other than that, there is just a lot of mystery about them. But more importantly, in the last few years, we've been discovering that a lot of viruses, and also a lot of bacteria, do seem to reside in the upper layers of the atmosphere, up to about 77 kilometers actually, and this was discovered using these so-called sounding rockets, or basically meteorological uh, rockets that are launched into space or into upper atmosphere to collect various amounts of materials and to then return them back to Earth and to do a lot of other small experiments. These are usually really cheap to produce, so a lot of countries use them. But in a nutshell, we do know that there are viruses and bacteria in the atmosphere, we do know that there are a lot of them there, and obviously they do have some interaction with various atmospheric effects, including of course the effects from the sun itself. Based on the solar pressure studies, uh, we've discovered that up to about maybe a billion or so viruses could be deposited to approximately a square meter of Earth every single day. And this of course is a very interesting proposition. Could solar winds, and essentially solar pressure, cause more viruses to fall onto the planet and cause pandemics. So, so far, all of these different studies suggest that maybe. Now, we don't really have a definitive conclusion yet, and one of the studies that is still investigating whether viruses could even come from outer space and fall onto the planet is still in progress. The Japanese Tanpopo mission, which I'll discuss in one of the future videos, is essentially responsible for trying to identify the amount of various lifelike or even viral-like particles that could have been captured by the International Space Station while it orbited around the planet for approximately three years. Essentially, these gel capsules were capturing all sorts of materials for three years, and now they've been returned back to Japan and are still being investigated to discover if there's anything there that suggests so-called panspermia or the possibility for viruses and bacteria to come from outer space. But considering the fact that UV radiation can easily destroy a virus, how could it even survive there? Well, several studies actually discovered that a lot of viruses can easily survive a lot of different radiation if they're covered by, um, for example, carbon molecules or any other compounds that can sort of counteract the effects of UV light. In other words, there are a lot of ways for viruses to survive in outer space without being destroyed. And since we've already discovered so many different things related to life in various asteroids, including, for example, ribose, various amino acids, even the first ever protein, which I've discussed in one of the previous videos, this whole idea of viruses from outer space does actually kind of make a little bit more sense now. 
But nevertheless, does it actually add any credibility to this observation? The observation that higher uh, solar winds could actually produce more pandemics. Well, yes, in this particular situation, but this pattern is actually broken in the last few decades. So specifically here, if we were to look at some of the last few pandemics, including the 2009 uh, so-called swine flu pandemic, and of course the 2020 pandemic that we're going through right now, both of them occurred during the lowest possible solar wind activities in the last 40 or even 50 years. So here is 2009, here is 2020, these are solar minima, which essentially right away contradicts this idea and basically makes it a moot point. But it kind of is interesting, why is it that now we have a cycle of 11 years yet again? Now it's during solar minima. And also here, during the cycle 23 in 2002, that's kind of when SARS appeared. And for cycle 24, 2013, that's both Zika and Ebola. Now, that could be a complete coincidence though, as a matter of fact, it probably is. Nevertheless, it's still kind of interesting to see that there is a cyclical nature to how these pandemics happen around our planet. It's very unusual that approximately every 11 years, something like a pandemic, or at least an epidemic of major proportions, seems to actually appear on our planet somewhere on one of the continents. But that's probably nothing to do with the sun. It's a lot more likely that all of this is related to steady and continuous encroachment of humans onto the areas of nature where viruses could reside in different animals. And also, a lot of these viruses did seem to, for the most part, come from bats. And since bats do spend a large part of their life flying around in the atmosphere, is it possible that they could also pick up some of these viruses that are present in the atmosphere? But that's of course a very far-fetched assumption and needs to be investigated in a lot of detail. So in short, it does seem that the pattern that was observed in the first, I guess, 100 years or so, since uh, the Spanish flu up until about the 1990s, was simply just a coincidence. Or at least may have been formed by some other cycle that we're not really observing here, and the solar wind is very unlikely to be responsible for causing more viruses to appear on the planet. But honestly, one of the best conclusive results will come from the Tanpopo mission, and depending on what they discover from this particular mission, we might be actually changing the story once again. For now though, I would have to pretty strongly say that there is really no evidence to support this argument. The correlation between solar spots and pandemics is very likely just a coincidence, even though we do know for a fact that a solar wind can technically cause certain particles to fall to the ground, and may even cause more viruses to fall to the ground. Nevertheless, I'm not going to say this as a fact, because that's really how science works, right? Once we have more evidence, we'll probably change the story again. But as of today, as of this current pandemic that's going on, I don't think we have to blame our sun for this. I definitely think it's sort of our own fault. Human encroachment is the biggest problem here. But anyway, it's actually really thanks to the missions conducted on the International Space Station that we probably will have an answer to all of this in the next few years. Hopefully someone will actually discover something out there, possibly even some kind of a virus coming from outer space, and this may even give us a chance to talk more about the idea of panspermia once again. And by the way, the fact that we've found so many different bacteria and viruses living in our own atmosphere is also the reason why so many scientists today believe that the atmosphere of Venus is filled with these viruses and bacteria as well, and are probably responsible for all of these unusual effects and these unusual spots that we're seeing on the surface that are actually unexplained even today. So in other words, there's a huge chance that viruses and bacteria reside here, and they might be actually very similar to the ones living on the planet Earth. But we're not going to know for sure until we go there and investigate this in more detail. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a relatively recent discovery in regards to ourselves but also in regards to the magnetic field of our planet Earth. So many times before, I've mentioned how important the magnetosphere of our planet is. It's essentially the biggest protective shield we have. It's also something that we probably would not survive without. But it's also that a lot of different species on our planet have learned to use quite effectively for various different needs. For example, to navigate around the planet and to find their place on planet Earth. And this is something that's not new to us, this is something that we've known about for many, many years. But the thing is, we keep discovering more and more animals that seem to possess this feature of being able to feel the magnetic field. For example, about five years ago, we found out that, turns out, dogs seem to prefer to poop in a very certain direction. And you may have noticed this if you have a pet, specifically if you have a dog, of course. 
When a dog really needs to poop, you may have noticed that they actually start circling around and kind of start placing themselves as if they were looking for a certain direction. Turns out, they are actually doing just that. They're looking for a north to south direction, which is their preferred position. They almost never seem to poop in the west to east direction. And we obviously have no idea why. This is just one of the more unusual examples, but there are quite a lot of animals that do seem to possess these unusual features. We actually refer to this as magnetoreception. And a lot of animals, such as for example sharks, whales, and of course pigeons, rely on this for survival. And although we do understand to some extent how pigeons, for example, do it and how sharks, for example, do it, there are still some animals, like dogs, where we really have no idea what's happening. For pigeons, we know that it's inside their beak. There seems to be what's known as a kind of a magnetite-based receptor, this is actually magnetite, a magnetic rock, that's present in their beak that seems to indicate to them what direction the magnetic field is coming from. At least this is sort of how we believe it works. Something similar happens in sharks, but certain other animals seem to possess receptors in their eyes, specifically something known as cryptochrome. This is yet another way some animals seem to be able to perceive the magnetic field. But today we're not really talking about other animals, we're talking about us. Because it seems that humans also possess a very unusual way of detecting the magnetosphere, although we don't really know why or how. And all of this is based on this brilliant research, which actually is a follow-up to some of the research that was done a few decades ago. And the idea here is really simple. They took 34 different people, they put them into what's known as Faraday cage, which essentially protects you from any kind of electromagnetic interference, and inside of this cage, inside of this box, they were able to create a kind of an artificial magnetic field, which they could actually um, manipulate by rotating it around. In other words, think of it as a magnetosphere, but in a box, with an ability to change directions and to essentially rotate it in any direction the researchers wanted. But those 34 subjects also had something attached to their heads and essentially this was to measure different types of brain waves as the experiment was conducted. Even though the person here was always asked to sit still and to always look in the same direction, when the researchers manipulated the magnetic field inside the box, their brains seemed to have reacted to it and in the way that we usually refer to as stimulus response. Now here, the way it works is basically when you just kind of sit around and you idle and you do nothing, you think about nothing, your brain will start producing what's known as alpha waves, which are very specific uh, types of different waves that are usually around 8 to 12 hertz in frequency. But then suddenly, if you notice something or if you start thinking about something or if something catches your eye and you actually intensely focus on it, this is where your wave pattern will change. This alpha wave activity that you see right here actually kind of disappears and becomes a lot less prominent and is replaced by other waves. And the type of waves that they are usually replaced to are normally something like gamma wave, which is a little bit faster, it has higher frequency, and this usually indicates that the person is processing information or is engaged in their memory and so on. Well, it just so happens when the magnetic field inside those boxes was actually rotated, approximately a third of all subjects experienced this change in different waves. Basically, the alpha waves went down, whereas the other waves started to become more apparent. As if they were literally experiencing the sensation of the magnetic field in their brains. And this is where it gets a little bit more unusual, because it seems that this is a genetic component. Only one third of all subjects experienced it. Two thirds felt nothing which actually does suggest something. It suggests that this so-called magnetoreception is a kind of a vestigial um, feature. Basically, it's something that used to exist in our ancestors, something that we probably used quite a lot, but we don't really use anymore. A very good example of this is how some people can actually use their ears or move their ears, very similar to how animals can do it, but not everyone is able to do so. This is a genetic component that's vestigial and does not exist in most people. Another really common example is something we all get, the goosebumps, which is a response that's actually kind of useless now. This used to be really, really important for when we had a lot of fur, but since for the most part we're kind of hairless now, at least don't have as much hair as we used to, this response is technically completely useless for humans. Which is what the scientists think is happening here as well. It's a response that probably existed in our ancestors who possibly used the magnetoreception for navigation or for some other reason but it just doesn't seem to affect us anymore because we don't need it. 
And interestingly, the molecular biologists who read this study were actually not surprised by this at all. And that's because similar to how pigeons have magnetite in their beaks, we've discovered in the last few years that humans have a lot of magnetite in their brain. And we don't really understand what it's doing there or what it was used for before. And this magnetite seems to be present in pretty much most of the humans out there. And on top of that, our eyes contain cryptochrome, which is also very unusual. Now we think it's responsible for vision, but at the same time it can technically sense magnetic field as well. And what's even more interesting and I guess in some sense more comical is that last year the South Korean researchers conducted an extremely interesting experiment. They essentially took a bunch of starved guys, and here we're talking about men, not women, put them in a box, rotated the box around, and had them try to orient themselves towards food. The combination of hunger, blue light, and the fact that they were male allowed them to almost always accurately pinpoint where the food was located. And that is something that's extremely unusual and very interesting. But when the light was not blue, so for example when it was red light, or when they were not starving, or when they were women, they couldn't do it. It was only for starved males in blue light, which for some reason resulted in them being able to pinpoint where the food was after all. Now there might be some explanation to this, and there might be some kind of evolutionary hunter-gatherer explanation, but right now we actually have no idea why this experiment worked and what exactly it shows us. It does seem to indicate though that somehow blue light encourages our perception of the magnetosphere, and at the same time our instincts, specifically hunger, seem to encourage it even more. Or at least they do so if you're a guy. Doesn't seem to work for ladies as well. Anyway, so these are really, really important and also really interesting experiments because they do allow us to understand ourselves so much more. There are still so many new things for us to learn about our planet, the magnetosphere, and of course, ourselves. And studies like this do help us understand how we evolved and what all of our instincts and, of course, our feelings mean. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to be talking about another unusual discovery coming from a meteorite that once upon a time fell onto our planet Earth. This time we discovered something we really didn't expect, a protein. In the last few years we've been discovering a lot of really interesting things in various meteorites mostly because our techniques of looking for things inside rocks has improved quite dramatically. Only a few months ago I've made a video where I talked about the discovery of ribose, an extremely important sugar that's responsible for the production of RNA. R is ribose. We've also been discovering a lot of other life components, even things like amino acids and um, simple molecules that are usually needed and also essential for life. And so because of this, the idea for panspermia, or the creation and delivery of life from outer space, has been slowly gaining grounds because there is more and more evidence that life can be created in outer space. And so it was only a matter of time before we discovered something else unusual in one of these meteorites. And this time we've discovered something else even more unusual, a protein. A molecule that's absolutely crucial for life on Earth. Now we're practically made of proteins, but what exactly are they and how do they relate to life itself? A protein is an extremely complex chain of molecules, with some proteins being so ridiculously complex and extremely, extremely advanced that they actually resemble miniature robots. And without exception, all proteins are generally made in similar ways. It all starts with a DNA molecule that then transforms into RNA molecule that then is actually used to create a protein chain, which is usually a chain of different amino acids in a really, really specific order, which then with help from other smaller proteins, folds into a very, very specific shape and finally becomes what's known as a protein complex. This is the most commonly used protein complex, this is the hemoglobin responsible for carrying oxygen in our blood, but pretty much every protein in your body and basically almost everything in you is made in a somewhat similar way by using DNA molecules, creating RNA, then turning this into a chain that then folds into the protein itself. But this of course is an example of a biogenic protein or so-called biomolecule. There are obviously proteins that can be created abiogenically or basically without the use of DNA and RNA, in other words artificially, or it could even be created completely autonomously by itself through the collection of various amino acids coming together and then creating complex shapes completely naturally. In other words, technically you can have a protein that's created abiogenically as well, without any life. 
One really good example of this experiment was actually um, in the International Space Station approximately six years ago, when the scientists were able to create various proteins in the orbit of Earth and realized that it's actually a lot easier for proteins to form naturally in microgravity conditions. Without gravity, they seem to actually be created much easier than with gravity. And this also reinforced the idea that we should be able to find various types of abiogenic proteins somewhere out there in various meteorites as well. And this is exactly what happened just now. The protein just discovered in the meteorite known as Acfer086 that was discovered back in 1990 and that seems to resemble something like this is literally that what we've been looking for for a very long time. It seems to be a naturally produced protein created in outer space and seems to be a major piece of evidence for the creation of life in outer space and also for the spread of life across various planets and moons. In other words, this is a really strong evidence for panspermia or also for the possibility of life being created in other regions of the solar system. And once again, the reason we think this is a protein and not just some sort of an amino acid is because it's, this is a chain of different amino acids all together and it also has the beginning and the end, or maybe this is the beginning and this is the end. And because this protein seems to contain both iron and lithium at the same time, the scientists who discovered this protein decided to name it hemolithin, essentially an iron-lithium containing protein, just as it says right here. And the thing is, we've had this meteorite since 1990, when we discovered it back in Algeria, but we haven't really been analyzing it that much, and we've only originally discovered the initial molecules, so-called glycine. But some of the more recent techniques, and specifically the microscope and the mass spectrometry techniques, advanced so much that we're now able to see things much more clearly and with a lot more detail. Which of course implies that if we apply the same technique to other meteorites we have on the planet, we might discover even more of these unusual proteins, especially in those meteorites where we originally found amino acids to begin with. And if you'd like to learn more about the actual technique used in this study, it's known as MALDI, or MALDI, or MALDI? Anyway, this technique uh, is really complex, so it's sort of beyond the scope of this video, but I'm going to leave the link for you in the description. But can this in some sense be the evidence for existence of aliens or extraterrestrial intelligence or extraterrestrial life to begin with? Not really. Right now what we see is essentially just a simple protein molecule that was very likely created naturally. It's probably a result of different amino acids coming together in the low gravity conditions like they did in International Space Station and creating a complex and then also adding a few atoms like iron and lithium. Currently there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that this is in any way made by bacterial life or that it in some way relates to any kind of life in the meteorite itself. Although obviously a lot of follow-up studies are needed to try to discover a little bit more about this particular protein because this is one of the more exciting discoveries of the year. And today most biologists and most chemists would agree that a protein creation by chance is actually extremely unlikely. A lot of things need to happen completely by chance pretty much in a short period of time for a typical protein to form just like that. So something extremely complex must have happened in this particular meteorite either as it was approaching planet Earth or as it spent billions of years in space or as it probably collided with planet Earth itself. So we're not entirely sure when this protein was created, but its discovery and its origin is definitely one of the biggest mysteries and biggest, most exciting discoveries of 2020 so far. And to make sure that this is an extraterrestrial protein and not the one from Earth, the scientists also measure the content of its hydrogen. And basically based on the amount of hydrogen to deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen, we can usually definitively say if something is from Earth or from outer space. And as you can imagine, this particular protein had a lot of deuterium, suggesting that it's probably from outer space. As a matter of fact, its deuterium values were very similar to the ones discovered around various comets, suggesting of course that this rock probably spent a long time in outer space and very likely had most of its chemical reactions done in zero gravity while orbiting around the Sun. But despite there being little doubt that this is an extraterrestrial protein, there's still a lot of questions in regards to what this can mean for panspermia or the creation or spreading of life across the universe. I guess the next step for us is to discover how these proteins interact in outer space and if by chance they can also create something a little bit more complex, especially in the presence of water. Now this is something we're not going to be able to discover until future visits to objects like for example Europa, Ganymede and Titan. 
those places could potentially have even more proteins for us to discover and to learn how they interact in these very complex conditions where there is potentially liquid water. But in honesty, until we discover more, that's unfortunately it. We found a really cool protein, but we don't really know much else about it. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be combining astronomy with biology because there was a very brilliant paper that just came out that managed to actually analyze our universe by using something from here on Earth. Specifically, this thing. Can you guess what this is? So this right here has to be one of the most interesting, most intriguing organisms on our planet when it comes to creating various patterns. But what exactly is this? Is this some sort of a mold, a mushroom, an animal, or plant? Well, it's actually neither one of those things. It belongs to a species of animals known as protists. These are usually unicellular, but sometimes they do form relatively complex colonies where they collaborate, cooperate, and create these large structures. But the protist known as Fissarum has actually been used in science and even in art for many different projects for many different years now. Just like every other protist, these are unicellular organisms, but they do form these large colonies, which sometimes can be extremely complex and seem to do so with extreme efficiency. So essentially, because of the way that these organisms are able to create their connections, we can technically use them in the study of computing the shortest paths. So in other words, they're really good at finding the shortest path to the destination where there's obviously, I guess, more food or something. There are a lot of different artists, like for example, Heather Barnett, who created this uh, time-lapse video, that have used this organism for their creations and for their art. But in science, there have also been some really awesome projects. Like this project right here involved recreating the subway map or the metro map of Tokyo. And essentially by placing really large pieces of food around and each piece here represented a major part of Tokyo, the scientists witnessed how the slime itself was able to recreate these pathways which literally represented the subway map. In other words, this organism is able to create the shortest, most efficient paths and is able to do so within only a few hours. Now, for the most part, this is obviously something we can do with computers much easier and much more efficiently, but there are a lot of things we can learn from how the slime operates in trying to create these patterns that are extremely efficient and require the least amount of energy. And this is actually what a lot of mathematicians have been doing. They've been trying to learn from the slime to try to identify various patterns that can be used for various other scientific purposes. And so the scientists whose paper you can find in the description below took this to a completely next level. This was a multidisciplinary study involving different departments that kind of met up completely by accident. And what they really wanted to do is study the idea of cosmic web in a little bit more detail because just like so many other people, they must have seen, you know, one of these pictures that used to be trending on Facebook. And this is kind of true. I mean, brain cell does seem to kind of resemble what the universe might look like, specifically the cosmic web. And more specifically, because pictures of cosmic web do seem to resemble patterns created by this unusual slimy mold. But the idea here was not to really connect them in any way or try to find out why they form these patterns. The idea was to try to use the mold itself to then study the universe. And interestingly, this mold has already been used in other studies, like for example, in creating a kind of an electrical network by using the mold to simulate the most optimal network. So it's been known to scientists for quite a long time, but it's really never been applied to the universe, and more specifically, it has never been used in three dimensions. And so to do all of this, the scientists decided to create a kind of a computer model that would simulate the way that this mold propagates, but this time in three dimensions. And they actually call this Monte Carlo Fissarum machine. So in a nutshell, it's a computer simulation, but based entirely on how this mold would propagate in three dimensions. And then they used the so-called Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which had the database of a lot of different galaxies with the exact placement around the universe. This essentially allowed the scientists to place these tiny points from which the virtual mode would propagate. And then they let the computer run and see what kind of a network this would create. And by using approximately 37,000 different galaxies, they created quite an amazing picture. And what's even more interesting here is that even though this is virtual and computer generated, turns out it's extremely realistic. It seems to be almost an exact replica of what real cosmic web looks like. Because it turns out that by using this model, they were able to create something that has never existed before. A literal cosmic map of not just galaxies, but also the cosmic web in between those galaxies. And this is something that we've really wanted to have for a very long time. 
mostly because we've so far only had two-dimensional images and all of them were simulated, none of them were truly realistic. But I guess creating the map of Tokyo Subway is one thing. Could this actually be applied to the rest of the universe? Can we create some kind of a cosmic web map using this technique? Well, the scientists behind this paper, of course, had to test all of this. And they used some of the other telescope to try to observe locations that their model identified as the potential source of cosmic web, but the locations that we've never investigated or knew about. In other words, they tried to look at their model and then they pointed the telescope at those locations. And more specifically, by looking at various gas densities and also various quasars that we knew about, they were able to identify certain locations where there was cosmic web as predicted by their model. So, for example, by using Hubble telescope data, they were able to see the locations where they predicted gas to be much denser, so in other words, cosmic web would be a lot tighter, and it just so happens that Hubble telescope also saw the same. So, in other words, their simulation created an actual map of not just empty galaxies, but an actual three-dimensional map of cosmic web with every galaxy connected to the web itself. And this is extremely important for us, mostly because this allows us to not just understand that the universe seems to work exactly like we think it works, but also this gives us a way to improve our understanding of how the universe evolved, how it essentially will probably end up, and most importantly, it gives us an idea of what's happening with this whole dark matter thing. Because obviously here, dark matter is the biggest part of this web. And although it's probably true that not everything in this model is perfect, because it's still based on a simulation, and it's only based on a simulation that we've created using a model from Earth, for the most part, it does seem to represent the universe as we expect it to be. But I guess the big question here, how is it even possible that some mold from planet Earth was able to create something similar to what the universe might look like? Well, the idea here is because everything in nature sort of works with the same principle. For example, the way that shortest paths are created in the universe with the cosmic web and with the actual expansion of the universe happening would be very similar to how mold tries to get from one food source to another. This is where a lot of optimization is required to try to find the shortest possible path to save as much energy as possible, which is basically how physics and universe work as well. So these very efficient food pathways, or technically this extremely optimized network of transportation of various materials, would be pretty much similar to the cosmic web. Except that instead of food in the middle, the brightest spots here would be galaxies filled with stars, planets, and a lot of other mass. So these would be the centers of concentration of mass. And all of these filaments in between would be diffuse hydrogen gas mixed with occasional stars, occasional globular clusters, and a lot of dark matter. And all of this is of course separated by these huge voids in between. Uh, some of them are, at least in the universe, are really, really big. And we can also see these voids pretty much everywhere in the universe where these efficient network pathways have to be generated. So here we have them as well, as we do in the picture I showed you previously with the brain and the universe, because there are also these voids everywhere inside our brain between the neurons that end up making connections that do look relatively similar as well. Once again, using similar principles of the shortest possible, most efficient path. But anyway, that's kind of all I wanted to mention in this video, and as always, you can check out the paper itself in the description below, and it's a really interesting read because it combines several different sciences and is honestly one of the more interesting and more original papers that came out in the last few years. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video, we're going to be talking about viruses, but not really the coronavirus that's been going around, mostly because I think we've all heard enough about it. So let's discuss this other discovery coming from China that was unfortunately buried by all of the other news. So I'm sure most of you by now have already been kind of fed up with all of the panic and all of the news coming about the Chinese coronavirus, which is why we're not really going to talk about this at all. But just because I also like to educate people on various scientific topics, I have to tell you three major things about coronaviruses. Fact number one. We've all had coronavirus at some point in our lives. About 20% of all of the colds are very likely caused by one of the four major coronaviruses that have been going around human population uh, for quite a while now. So if you've had a cold recently, there's a 20% chance that one of these coronaviruses was responsible for it. But there are of course three more different coronaviruses that have been discovered in the last uh, two decades or so. SARS was the first one, then we had MERS, which is actually the deadliest one, and even today, MERS has been responsible for at least 48 different fatalities uh, last year alone, so it is a much more dangerous virus. And so the Wuhan virus is technically the seventh discovered uh, coronavirus. 
But here's the thing though. Something else was discovered in China only a few weeks ago that unfortunately most of the major outlets never got to cover. And we're talking about zombie viruses. Okay, not these kinds of zombies. These kinds of zombies. The viruses and bacteria that have been buried inside ice deposits for a very, very long time. And something that we've been discovering in various ice cores as we started extracting them around the world. But most recently, in January of 2020, a very interesting paper became available coming out of a Chinese university that analyzed various ice cores coming out of Tibetan glaciers. And unfortunately, these glaciers have been slowly melting away. As a matter of fact, approximately 25% of all of the glaciers located in Tibet have actually melted since 1970s, thus freeing up a lot of water, but also a lot of things hiding in those ices. And according to the paper that just came out, and according to these Chinese scientists, some of those things are so-called zombie viruses. Now here's the most interesting part about the discovery. Out of 33 different types of viruses discovered in those samples, 29 were completely new to science. And they believe that these viruses were trapped in the ice cores, or basically in the uh, uh, glaciers, for approximately 15,000 years or so. Now all of these glaciers were part of the so-called Gulia ice cap, roughly located in this region right here, and their discovery obviously presents us with a very interesting and somewhat scary scenario. You know, what if those viruses and those bacteria that we discovered escape into the drinking water and eventually infect the population living nearby? And although maybe it does sound like a pretty far out theory and idea, interestingly, it has occurred at least once back in 2016. More specifically, in Russia in uh, 2016, there was a very unusual thawing of permafrost right here in the Yamal Peninsula, which interestingly ended up releasing some of the spores of so-called anthrax. And these spores, as they were released into the herd of animals, ended up also infecting several people, and also, unfortunately, at least one 12-year-old boy passed away after contracting this bacterium. But one thing you have to remember though, well, with anthrax, that's unfortunately how this bacteria propagates. It stays dormant inside permafrost, and then when the conditions are right, it gets released and possibly infects something. In other words, it's not really a reason for us to panic just yet because that's exactly what anthrax is supposed to do. But if you'd like to learn more about this particular story, I'm posting their article from the Scientific American down below that explains this in a little bit more detail. But the thing is, when this occurred, media kind of presented this idea of these zombie viruses and zombie pathogens that could one day possibly escape and infect us and thus cause some sort of a pandemic somewhat similar to what's happening with the Chinese virus right now. And a few years ago, NASA has also discovered even older viruses up to about 50,000 years old in these deposits in a Mexican cave, further suggesting that we could one day catch something really ancient that we have no immunity for. So I guess the fear is there, and the idea of catching these zombie viruses is pretty real. And when you think about it, the idea of catching some kind of a bacteria or a virus that's been trapped in ice for hundreds or even thousands of years is pretty terrifying. Which is why I wanted to talk about another really interesting story of a very interesting person. A person that you can see right here, his name is Jonah Halton. Halton went to this really unfortunate town in Alaska known as the Brevik Mission. This town is famous because it was essentially almost completely wiped out during the 1918 Spanish flu infection or pandemic. And his only goal was to try to discover if the Spanish flu was still present in the bodies of the deceased that he was able to acquire back in 1951. And Jonah's goal was scientific. He wanted to see if the bacteria was still active and deadly after about, I guess, 30 to 40 years. Now, obviously, this is not something very safe, but he was a very curious person. And because of his discoveries, later on, the scientists were able to very accurately analyze uh, the Spanish flu virus, discovering all of its genome, and that allowed us to create a vaccine for any kind of a epidemic that might happen again. But the important part of his uh, study back in 1951 is that he really tried to resurrect the virus, but it just didn't work. None of the viruses were viable anymore. None of them actually were able to create any new infections in any of the cells that he tried to use. And thus, this was um, a pretty interesting discovery. So these ancient viruses, these really old viruses, might not even be dangerous to us anymore. In other words, what he discovered is that these zombie viruses and zombie bacteria might actually not be dangerous after all. 
Similar and yet, I guess, somewhat dangerous studies were done with smallpox, a very deadly virus as well. And none of these smallpox bacteria that infected people um, hundreds of years ago were active either. None of them could be reactivated after uh, decades and hundreds of years in the ground. And what this implies is that, for the most part, it seems that these zombie viruses and zombie bacteria are no longer able to infect anyone. Although I do have to kind of say this with a bit of caution because some scientists studying those viruses or those bacteria have potentially been infected by something similar. But the interesting or I guess the funny part is that they were infected by the actual samples that they were studying. So here's where we come to a very ironic truth and discovery about all of this. It seems that the people that are most at risk from these zombie viruses and bacteria are the curious people trying to study them. In other words, the scientists studying these viruses have to be the ones taking the most precaution. In other words, scientists trying to study these ice cores have to take a lot more precaution. And I'm not saying they shouldn't really do this. I'm not saying it's dangerous if they continuously try to dig out these samples. Because discovering these viruses and these bacteria that could be hiding is important. We have to be ready for anything. But they definitely have to establish better techniques and better uh, precautionary measures for us to, well, essentially not end up with another coronavirus on our hands. Luckily for us, the study that I mentioned in the beginning does provide us with really good guidelines and they even established a new interesting technique on how to try to discover these viruses and bacteria without contaminating the samples or, I guess, in some sense yourself. So this particular study was really well done. Unfortunately, like I said, it was released right as the coronavirus outbreak began. So most people, including people in China, have never heard of this study and will probably not hear about it for a while. But I thought it was a pretty interesting discovery because finding so many new viruses and discovering so many new uh, different pathogens that existed a long time ago will actually help us understand our own evolution and most importantly, help us understand if any of these viruses have interacted with humans or our ancestors before and how this might have affected us as well. Now, there's going to be another video on viruses coming out relatively soon where I'm going to explain why it's actually really important for us to study viruses and understand them. And just to give you a slight spoiler, it has to do with our genome, because our genome is very mysterious and contains viruses. But you're going to learn more about this in one of the future videos. On that note, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Most importantly, don't panic about coronavirus. Just take the regular precautions that you normally would and get your flu shot, because that's also really important. And fun fact about coronaviruses, this is what we actually refer to as corona. This is why they're called coronaviruses, because of this unusual crown-like receptors on the surface of the virus. So stay healthy, make sure to wash your hands, possibly wear gloves if you want to prevent any kind of infection, and well, that's it. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to be talking about viruses once again. I guess in some sense it's because coronavirus is still in the news and because people are still panicking, but also because in the previous video I promised you I'll talk about something really unusual and really interesting in regards to viruses. Now, with all of the talk of coronavirus still in the news and pretty much everyone around me sort of panicking, buying all kinds of masks, gloves, hand sanitizers and so on, I'm sort of amazed at how far some people go to actually try to protect themselves from viruses. And I think one of the major reasons why people panic so badly, especially now, is really because we have this unusual, very negative image of viruses that seem to us almost like an alien species or something completely foreign that should not be in our bodies. And if you've taken biology in high school, you know that um, bacteria and viruses are sort of part of our lives. And um, well, as a matter of fact, right now, as I'm breathing and speaking to you, I'm inhaling at least a hundred or so viruses pretty much every breath that I take. And in some sense, this is natural to us. Viruses and bacteria are everywhere. I mean, your bellies and your digestion system would not even work without the introduction of bacteria into your gut system. So, in some sense, we depend on a lot of different bacteria and, to some extent, viruses. And this is actually something that we've only discovered in the last few years or so. Because it turns out, even though we're so scared of viruses and even though there is some merit to being protected from viruses, especially the ones that could potentially, well, technically kill us, the modern biological discoveries suggest to us that, well, viruses are far from being these invasive alien species that are trying to, well, destroy our lives. They're actually not that at all. As a matter of fact, several major recent studies discovered that approximately 8% of the entire DNA humans have are essentially viruses. Dormant viruses. Something we used to refer to as junk DNA. 
But as we learn more and more about DNA, we kind of realize that it's not junk at all. A lot of these pieces of DNA we previously thought were useless are far from being useless. Many of them we just don't understand yet. And the most interesting part about these discoveries is that these viruses have been inside our DNA for millions and even hundreds of millions of years. Essentially, they were there since even before these ancestors that we had uh, approximately a few million years ago. Because some of these viruses have been in our DNA for hundreds of millions of years when our ancestors were really, really simple organisms. And they stayed in our DNA this whole time. And since out of about 100,000 different genes in our DNA, only about 20,000 are responsible for making us what we are, there is still a lot of mystery inside the genetic code. And turns out that of those 100,000 genes, approximately 8,000 or so are all sorts of ancient viruses that's been with us for a very long time. Now, we're still kind of learning about what they do in our DNA and if they're dangerous or if they're actually beneficial to us, but there are a few studies that have already discovered several really interesting things. For example, many different virologists or people who study viruses believe that a lot of these viruses do actually help us in developing our own bodies. A few years ago, scientists discovered that pregnant women seem to produce this very unusual protein known as hemo but then they couldn't really figure out what produces it. And it turns out that this protein is made by an ancient virus in our DNA. In other words, this ancient virus starts producing this protein and it seems to actually act on the human body as the uh, fetus develops. As a matter of fact, they discovered that hemo is absolutely essential for the production of fetus. And one of the ways that it helps fetus develop is by suppressing the immune system of the mother, protecting fetus from, from mother immune system. And this is absolutely mind-blowing when you think about it. In other words, the virus that probably a long time ago was not beneficial and probably very dangerous to the original species that it infected has now over millions of years evolved to kind of protect us, at least when it comes to the development of our own child. And this, in a sense, is how complex all of this becomes. A lot of these viruses, when they became integrated into our own DNA, they over time became beneficial. Not all of them, but many of them have evolved to help us as well. And though it's very likely that this particular virus infected our species or our ancestors about 100 million years ago, when various mammals became more widespread around the planet, in the last few years, we also discovered that some of these viruses even managed to infect various marine mammals that then evolved to live on land. And what this of course suggests is that pretty much most animals, if not all animals on the planet, have these endogenous viruses in their DNA. And pretty much all of the animals very likely evolved along with viruses, acquiring some beneficial things and acquiring some things that maybe are not as beneficial. And we know that not all of these viruses are beneficial. Even though hemo does seem to be something that's good and important for us, a few of these endogenous viruses do produce certain bad conditions. Like for example, some of them may have been correlated with multiple sclerosis. Some of them may also um, potentially cause schizophrenia. And a few of these viruses have also been involved in other medical conditions. The rule of the thumb so far is that the younger the virus is in our DNA, the more likely it is to be somewhat dangerous to us. So basically, the more ancient the virus is, the more likely it's going to be beneficial. And what's really unusual is that most of these viruses hiding in our DNA are for the most part similar type. They're actually all retroviruses. And one of the most famous retroviruses is HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. Which of course suggests that over time, over the next few millions of years, it's very likely that HIV might also become part of our DNA. Now, how? How does this even happen? How did these viruses manage to infect our DNA and get inside of it? Well, the way that it usually works, when a virus infects a body, it might occasionally infect the so-called sex cells, basically the uh, cells responsible for reproduction. And if by chance it infects either the sperm cell or the egg, it might actually get integrated into the DNA of these cells and then propagate through various generations. So today we believe that some of these retroviruses were able to infect one of these sex cells and stayed with us for essentially a very, very long time. And many of them have eventually become kind of more or less disabled. In other words, 
Even though originally these viruses were probably pretty dangerous to the uh, creatures that they infected, over time they might have lost some of the components including the more dangerous protein that they produce and thus in some sense become more helpful than dangerous. And most importantly, over time they probably lost their ability to infect other cells, thus leaving behind some of the viral abilities, but not all of them, not the ones that would basically kill us. And over the past decade or so, we've discovered so many of these unusual viruses in many different species. Here is a kind of a tree of just some of them from different species, and as we learn more and as we discover more, this will actually grow in size. This, this has only been created a few years ago. And even though for the most part these viruses have lost their ability to damage our cells, they do seem to affect us um, in some sense negatively under certain conditions. And interestingly, the biggest cause usually is either stress of some sort or some sort of a sickness. So in some situations, these retroviruses actually do come out and become a little bit more dangerous, causing certain conditions. But unfortunately, it's too early for doctors to say with certainty what exactly these viruses do to human bodies. But we've discovered a lot of really interesting things in the last few years. For example, we know that some of these retroviruses or endogenous retroviruses are uniquely human. Yet some of them were shared by different species including fish and human beings. At the same time, it seems that some of our cells evolved to coexist and to even uh, interact with these viruses. And for some reason, human placentas seem to produce a lot of different viral components. Some of the modern discoveries, for example, suggest that viruses are responsible for helping certain cells fuse together. And when these viral components were silenced, when the scientists were able to actually quiet them down in certain species like mice, because obviously these studies were not done with humans, in those situations, the actual embryo was not really developed at all, or at least it had a serious development problem. Here's one of these unusual proteins, and this was only discovered about five years ago from when I'm making this video. So in other words, what this shows us is that a lot of these viruses that are in our DNA guide our evolution and also guide our reproduction. And many of them also seem to be able to control our immune system, either turning it on or turning it off. And in some sense, it is very beneficial, especially when the baby is developing. But in other cases, like for example, if it's a kind of a virus that completely disables our immune system, it's obviously a lot more dangerous. And one of the interesting ways that the viruses are definitely able to control human development is by being able to control the turning on and turning off of the so-called stem cells. So it seems that a lot of these viruses are actually able to maintain stem cells in their original form, which actually prevents stem cells from differentiating into other cells. So essentially when the baby develops, these viruses seem to actually stop the development from happening too early or from doing wrong things. And even though it doesn't really make sense, it makes sense from a viral perspective. By keeping stem cells as stem cells longer, these viruses are then able to propagate more successfully throughout other cells. So in other words, the viruses are helping themselves, but at the same time, they're also helping us and are thus controlling the differentiation of our cells in our bodies. And this doesn't just apply to babies and fetuses, this also seems to apply to just general stem cell differentiation. In other words, it's very likely that right now in your body, viruses are controlling differentiations of your cells. But a lot of other studies done on mice, cats and even koalas suggest that, well, in many cases these viruses can also cause problems and disease. So we need to study them in a lot more detail to understand how exactly this relationship with viruses works in our bodies. And there's another major reason why we need to study this in a little bit more detail. The main reason is because in the last few years, scientists started to develop the techniques known as xenotransplantation, essentially taking the organs from, for example, pigs and then transplanting them into people. And this is usually done because obviously it's a lot easier to find, for example, a pig kidney. And also because in many cases, um, these organs are similar enough to ours to be used in humans as well. But the thing is, what recent studies discovered is that pigs have their own retroviruses, their own endogenous retroviruses that could potentially get expressed in humans and cause serious, serious problems. Which is why identifying exactly what these viruses are in pigs and trying to see if they affect humans is extremely important. And not just pigs, any other animals as well. In other words, there are still a lot of things to be studied about these unusual viruses and most importantly, a lot of things to understand on how they influence our own development. But the important thing to take away here is that despite their negative image and a lot of fear that they produce, viruses are not these alien foreign bodies, these invaders that are coming from out of nowhere. They are part of us 
and they're a big part of us, approximately 8%. And they also seem to help us quite a lot and in many situations even help us develop into what we are. And this is of course true of every living being on the planet. Viruses and living beings have developed to, in a sense, live together and to help each other even though it's not really as obvious and as clear-cut as it is with some of the other things. And so it's possible that in the next decade or so we'll be able to discover a lot more unusual things about these viruses and maybe even find a way to help these viruses help us even more. In other words, we might be able to control them to the point where they become even more beneficial and protect us from disease. Although for now, I guess we're still going to be panicking about various viruses happening around the world because most people today do not know about these interesting discoveries. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about the actual scientific reasons for why it seems that it's true that men are more likely to unfortunately die younger. And this is something that we've recently discovered and genetically confirmed. So good news ladies, you're definitely going to be living much longer than us. And this is something that's definitely scientific and has recently been shown in many different species. But let's take a step back and talk about what this all means. And first of all, if you were to look at the list of life expectancy around the world, you'll discover a very unusual pattern. In every single country, no matter what the culture is, no matter what the structure of the family is, and pretty much no matter any other factor, you'll discover that on average, women do live longer, approximately 5 years or so. And this seems to be true for countries where there is war, there is no war, or even in countries where it's technically kind of more or less equal in terms of gender equality. And although stereotypically we usually explain this because men tend to be risk takers and because men tend to be the ones going to war and essentially, well, you know, dying for the country, they're also more likely the ones to pick up unusual bad habits such as smoking, drinking, or any other risk taking behavior such as I guess walking in the forest with a backpack? Okay, definitely not the best stock footage I could find. Here's something better. Reckless, dangerous driving. Well, anyway, you get the idea. Men seem to take more risks. At least stereotypically speaking. And this is why we always thought maybe that's actually why the life expectancy is much lower. But various cross-generation and cross-culture studies keep finding almost the opposite. It doesn't seem to actually predict anything in regards to culture or behavior. Age does seem to be more genetic. And the scientists who published this paper relatively recently may have finally found the answer. It's a lot more genetic than we originally thought, and the answer is a lot simpler than we thought. It really has a lot more to do with genetic repairability, and thus ability to maintain healthier body. And to try to establish the relationship between genes and um, longevity, they actually investigated a lot of different animals. Some relatively similar to us, others a lot more primitive and a lot simpler. And the goal was really simple, to find a genetic relationship between longevity and what you would call genetically gender. Specifically, they wanted to see if the, for example, XX chromosomes that women get and XY chromosomes can actually correlate with the longevity. And as you can probably tell, yes, they can. And the reasons seem to be really, really simple. And we currently refer to this as the unguarded X chromosome hypothesis. The idea here is that in most species, there are usually either two similar chromosomes, like for example for humans this would be XX, which would make it a female, or an X chromosome with a smaller Y chromosome, which would turn this into male. In other words, a lot of species seem to have this pattern. It's not always X and Y. For example, for chickens and other birds, the system is a little bit different. And there are also species where the actual gender and chromosomes um, are kind of reversed, whereas basically the male gets two chromosomes and the female gets one shorter and one longer one. But in a nutshell, this is the first step in trying to understand what's happening here. So when an animal has two same genes, it's a lot more likely to be able to repair it. And although generally our genes have a lot of ways of repairing themselves already, having two copies of a chromosome is yet another layer on top of that to help protect genetic code even more. And it seems that because women have two X genes, they're a lot less likely to suffer from various types of genetic disorders. And more specifically, from essentially aging in general. But to confirm this idea, just looking at humans was unfortunately not enough. There are still a lot of different other things, and here we're talking about cultural differences and gender rule differences that could technically explain the discrepancy between male and female age. And so to confirm this, the scientists behind this paper looked at over 200 different species, and they analyzed their genes as well. 
And this of course confirms the hypothesis. Every single animal that had two genes, even in those species where it's actually reverse roles, so basically males get two genes and females don't, the overall effects were quite similar or even more dramatic. A good example of this are things like moths and butterflies. Here, the actual genders are reversed, so the male gets two genes, whereas the female moth usually gets one shorter and one longer. And male moths live much, much longer than female moths. And it's exactly the same for birds. Here, you can see that the rooster has ZZ gene and the chicken has ZW. And roosters do live much longer than chickens, even though their behavior for the most part is a lot more risk-taking and aggressive. Roosters are the ones doing all the fighting. And the main explanation here is that even if you get some kind of a genetic disorder in one of your chromosomes, for females, the other chromosome takes over and repairs all of the damage. For males, however, if they get damaged in either X or Y chromosome, that's kind of it. The genetic code will start getting a lot more errors and slowly deteriorate causing a lot more various disorders. And when it comes to aggressive behavior as an explanation, there are certain species that actually have similar genes, but the opposite aggressive behavior. One example is spiders. Certain spiders do possess aggressive females and very docile males that basically are trying to survive. And in those cases, even though females are more aggressive and are more likely to take risks, they do seem to still live much longer. And unfortunately, there were no exceptions to this rule. So basically, having, I guess, an official backup to your gene is really important for longevity. Whereas for males that do only have one copy of their gene, unfortunately, this becomes a problem long term. And scarily enough for males, the difference in a lot of species was up to about 17% on average. In other words, if we were to consider average life to be 100 years, women would live approximately 17 years more. There were, however, some differences, like for example, for moths and other species where the roles are reversed, the differences were not as dramatic. Female moths only lived about 7% shorter than males, whereas for other species, the differences were even more dramatic, up to 21% difference. So this is where genetics really play a big role compared to other differences, like for example, gender roles. Even if women were the ones going to war, men would still very likely live much shorter. And furthermore, they also discovered that the actual lifespan differences were actually correlated with the length differences between the X and Y or other chromosomes. So the more difference there was, the more likely the females would live longer. Which is once again great news for women, who can now start taking a lot more risks and will still live longer than us. Guys. But anyway, I'm not really jealous. It's just interesting. It's really, really interesting. And it's something you can read by yourself uh, from the link in the description below. So, in a nutshell, genetics do play a much bigger role in longevity than we thought. And this is, I guess, something that shouldn't really come as a surprise. We've always expected that. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to be talking about this incredible new study that may have created an important foundation for computers to be able to communicate with us by using our brainwaves. But more essentially, it's actually going to help a lot of people that are unable to communicate in any other way. Now, I'm sure most of you have used Google Translate and you may have also clicked on this button that actually pronounces the words for you. This is what we refer to as text to speech. And just like a lot of other things Google has produced, it's based on artificial intelligence and the subtype of this field usually referred to as neural networks. And the thing is, about 15 to 20 years ago, the text-to-speech options were really, really limited and most computers could not really handle it. And so a lot of these advances in artificial intelligence really happened in the last 10 years or so. But could we actually go a step further? Could we find a way to interpret the brainwaves and then create speech out of that? Well, it turns out that the paper that was just recently released in Nature magazine did just that. They created the foundation for what could be essentially the transformation of how we communicate with each other, but also how various disabled patients that are unable to speak or are unable to move, for example, could communicate with others as well. Now here's why this is actually a groundbreaking discovery. A lot of this is based on the really, really old and really popular field known as brain-computer interface or brain-machine interface. For the most part, for the past few decades, we've actually done a lot of these studies on animals, normally mice or, in some cases, monkeys, and a lot of this was really intrusive. Essentially, you would have to drill into the brain of the monkey, insert electrodes, and then by measuring the electric activity inside the brain of the monkey, the so-called EEG activity, 
who could then try to find a way to manipulate various things like for example through detection of a certain signal the computer would then activate the arm to move objects around. This was pretty successful but it was kind of limited because it was never really applied to humans. And for obvious reasons, it was actually almost impossible to conduct these in humans, mostly because of the intrusiveness of the actual procedure. But in this paper, they managed to kind of go around this by using patients that already had electrodes in their brains, usually to monitor various problems that they had because of epileptic seizures. And so by using several participants that already had various electrodes inside the brains, they then asked them to do certain tasks and at the same time used a type of artificial intelligence known as recurrent neural network to train the AI to recognize these EEG patterns and then try to interpret them as certain words or certain sentences. So in other words, they took the EEG measurements, then trained the AI to recognize these measurements and connect them to various words, and thus eventually taught the AI to actually recognize the sentences and words that were being produced by the brain itself. Now, in a nutshell, this is kind of how it worked, but the reality was a little bit more complex. So basically, first of all, the patients had to pronounce the words verbally, they had to say them out loud, and this produced a very, very specific type of a brain activity that would essentially be interpreted as a certain word producing a certain type of EEG. And so for every type of brain activity, the AI would then have to connect this to the word being pronounced. And the way that neural networks usually work is through repetition, they eventually kind of learn to get better and better. And so after many, many trials, the artificial intelligence learned to recognize that certain brain patterns produced certain words. And what's interesting here is that they actually focus on words, suggesting that the brain itself was able to produce a word as an electrical symbol. And so, as I'm speaking to you right now, my brain is producing these individual electrical patterns that could technically be interpreted with enough training by artificial intelligence. And before you ask, this was not really related to reading someone's mind. As a matter of fact, the words had to be verbally pronounced for this EEG pattern to be detected. Although in some sense, study like this does actually imply that you could eventually teach the AI to read someone's mind as well. But what's really important about this particular discovery is that we now have a direct connection between verbal communication that's produced by the brain, which can be relatively easily interpreted by the recurrent neural network, and the actual interpretation of these symbols as words afterwards. Now, Overall, they did have a pretty good success eventually, after many trials, in detecting these words. But there were obviously still a lot of mistakes as well, simply because this is just the beginning, this is a pioneering study in this particular topic. While at the same time, only a very limited amount of words and sentences was used for this study. Specifically, it was 30 to 50 sentences for each of the subjects. And what is super interesting here is that this was enough for the artificial intelligence to establish very powerful connections to identify various signals and interpret them as actual words, with certain subjects having accuracy of about 97%. But unfortunately, this was a pretty small study with only four participants, simply because it's not really easy to find people that already have electrodes in their brain. But since the technology in EEG measurements has also been advancing in the last few years, I'm pretty sure at some point we're going to be able to measure all of this without various intrusive surgeries required to install these electrodes. So in other words, we'll be able to acquire all of this data remotely without using any surgeries and thus have a much better way of collecting data for some of the future studies as well. And because of the way that the study was designed, you could actually see how AI learned all of this. First, spitting out completely nonsensical words and sentences, but eventually acquiring a way to be extremely accurate relatively fast. And what's interesting is that the data from a single patient could then be transferred to another patient and with only minimal retraining you could have pretty accurate results as well. Although this does mean that people in general do produce slightly different EEGs, so using this algorithm means that you still have to retrain it for each individual person. Which of course also means that it's going to be practically impossible for this kind of algorithm to read someone's mind and to understand exactly what they're thinking about unless you train on that person first. And since last year, Elon Musk actually announced his new startup, uh, the so-called Neuralink, that's going to be pretty much doing all of this in a lot more detail. It means that in a few years from now, we're going to hear more about similar studies where a lot of other um, artificial intelligence networks are used to try to generate various activities, physical activities, from human brains. So it's very likely that this guy right here is going to create something really similar, but probably a lot more advanced in a few years from now. But just like with Google Translate, obviously this was not perfect and there were quite a lot of relatively silly and funny mistakes. 
For example, this sentence, those musicians harmonize marvelously, was actually interpreted as the spinach was a famous singer. And though I guess there are, might be some connections between the words, for example, singer and musician, it's still kind of interesting to see how the neural networks are not really going to be perfect ever. They're always going to make slight mistakes here and there. And as of right now, this was actually the most accurate such study with the most accurate results, even though it was relatively small in comparison to some of the other studies. In similar previous studies, the accuracy was only about 40%. Here it was close to 90 and even higher than 90 for at least one uh, subject. And so as it stands, it's very likely that by 2030, we're going to have a lot of really, really complex machines, probably something that you put on your ear or maybe something you wear as a hat that's going to be able to interpret everything you say and think and then say it for you and possibly even in different languages. Which of course is reminiscent of the babblefish from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And a good example of this is, of course, text-to-speech from early 2000s compared to what we have today. In 20 years, it has gone a really long way and it's only going to improve even more. So imagine what's going to happen with various brain-computer interfaces in about 20 years from now as well. And if this here only took about 40 minutes of training, with more participants and longer training, the results are going to be almost completely indistinguishable from actual speech as well. Which is, of course, why I think this is one of the more groundbreaking studies for a lot of people that are either unable to speak or have certain disabilities that prevent them from speaking normally. But once again, just to reinforce the idea, this is not reading someone's mind or reading someone's thoughts. This is just interpreting the brain waves created when you actually speak verbally. It's still very unlikely that this will be transferable to mental thoughts or inner voice, as it's called, because your inner voice works completely different and generates completely different EEG activity. So this is something that is still kind of impossible for us to do right now. But anyway, on that note, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Check out more from the paper in the description below. And hopefully we'll also hear from Elon Musk about what he's been up to with Neuralink as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about these unusual creatures you see on the screen. This is actually a type of an animal known as Heneguia salminicola. And it turns out that we just discovered that this is the only animal known to us that doesn't breathe. It does not need any oxygen. Okay, so technically on our planet, there are organisms that don't really require any oxygen. But normally these are really primitive bacteria, such as, for example, I guess the most famous bacteria is this right here. This is the so-called botulinum bacteria that's responsible for producing, well, essentially Botox. Which today is really famous for cosmetic surgery, but is also the most potent poison ever. Either way, the so-called anaerobic bacteria or anaerobic organisms, the organisms that don't require oxygen, are normally really, really ancient and very primitive. None of these ancient creatures would qualify as animals, basically what we would call any of these beautiful representative of Kingdom Animalia. And we've always believed that pretty much all of the animals always required oxygen for breathing through these so-called process known as cellular respiration that often requires this organelle that's found inside the cells known as mitochondria. Here's an actual image of these mitochondria and pretty much every single cell with some minor exceptions has these. And what these mitochondria usually do is use a relatively complex chain of chemical reactions that does include oxygen, which then produces what's known as ATP. And in a nutshell, without going into too much detail, ATP is essentially a universal fuel for every single cell in our body. Pretty much every time you breathe in and introduce oxygen into your system, this is then used to produce ATP, which is then used by other cells to do all kinds of different work, because this is how energy is made in our bodies and basically bodies of all of the animals around our planet. With this one exception that we just found only a few days ago from when I'm making this video. This strange animal right here that sort of looks like, I guess, human sperm, but in reality is actually a type of a jellyfish. This animal is part of a kingdom known as Cnidaria, which is basically jellyfishes and, of course, things that create corals. And also at the same time, this is one of the most important marine animal groups that only lives in the ocean and participates in all kinds of activity in the oceans. And for the most part, this kingdom divides into two major types, the swimming type and the sedentary type that kind of stays and does nothing. In total, there are over 11,000 different species of Cnidaria, and for the most part, all of them have one thing in common. They all possess these cells known as cnidocytes, which you might be familiar with, if you had ever been stunned by a jellyfish, the stain itself is from these nidocyte cells. And so all of them have these cells to some extent and some of them have actually evolved to use these cells differently. 
But there's also about a thousand or actually 1100 of these animals that over time became what's known as a parasite. They essentially live off other animals' products. And in most cases, these animals are some sort of a fish. And this strange animal known as Heneguia salminicola learned to live off the muscles of typical salmon. Actually, a lot of fishermen, when they catch salmon, they find these unusual bubbles inside that sometimes they refer to as Salmonella tapioca. Basically, these bubbles are created by these parasites, and they live inside the fish most of their adult life, while as babies they usually live inside different marine worms. And as these worms get eaten by salmon, they then get reintroduced into the fish itself. And so the scientists studying this unusual organism decided to try to investigate its DNA, and accidentally discovered that it doesn't possess any mitochondrial DNA. In other words, it's not able to produce these powerhouse of the cell. It's not able to breathe oxygen. Now, at first they thought it was a mistake, and so they decided to test another similar organism, which seemed to have been just fine. It seemed to have mitochondria, but surprisingly, Hanaguya had nothing. And the other interesting thing about these organisms is that they're relatively simple in terms of what they have and what they can do. For example, they also lost all of their nerves, their tissues, and even muscles. And these tiny looking objects that look like eyes, those are the nidocytes, the staining cells of typical um, jellyfish. But instead of staining and instead of actually catching the prey, instead they seem to be only used for grabbing onto the actual muscles of the fish and then feeding off it. So in other words, everything that these organisms used to have has now devolved completely. They became a lot simpler than they used to be. So in some sense, this is really interesting. Instead of becoming more complex over time, the organism here became much simpler and lost a lot of its previous functions. And it's probably because over time, the evolution led this organism to become really lazy. It sort of started relying on its host so much that it lost the ability to do anything else. In the past, it was probably very similar to other jellyfish. It was probably able to sting, it was probably able to even detect things, possibly even had muscles. Now it doesn't really have much. Its whole life cycle is essentially eating the muscles of salmon, reproducing, having the babies then swallowed by a worm, which then gets swallowed by fish to restart the same cycle. But how is it even possible for this organism to survive without breathing, without essentially using oxygen? Well, that's a huge mystery. Right now, the scientists think that maybe it's actually getting everything from the muscles of the fish. And so somehow it's able to get all of its needed nutrients from inside the fish's muscles. And that's really, really strange and we've never seen this before. So essentially, this is now one of the biggest biological mysteries we've discovered on planet Earth. Because either this organism has found a way to extract ATP from the fish itself, or it's somehow adapted to survive without this at all. Maybe it uses some other molecule for energy. And maybe, unlike other animals, it has devolved to be very similar to more ancient organisms from billions of years ago that used to be everywhere around the planet. Eventually, the oxygen-breathing animals took over, but until a few billion years ago, pretty much nothing here was breathing oxygen. But since this is a really recent discovery, we really know nothing else about this strange creature. We know that it doesn't breathe, we know it lives inside the fish, and I guess that's pretty much it. And one of the main reasons why the scientists behind the study believe that this organism devolved to not breathe is actually because in the DNA they discovered something that resembled mitochondria, or at least that used to be mitochondria, but was no longer functional. So in other words, Heneguia definitely seems to have lost the ability to breathe over time. We don't know when, but at some point it just decided to stop breathing altogether and instead just suck everything out of salmon. And it's very likely that one of the main reasons why this actually happened is because these uh, animals really thrive on being able to reproduce as quickly as possible. Basically here it's all about the numbers. So in order to reproduce as quickly as possible, they thought that, well, listen, if you don't breathe, you can do it even quicker. Which for the time being, at least, seems to work for these creatures for as long as salmon is around. And since these strange Cnidarian creatures are essentially some of the oldest animals on Earth, some of them are actually 700 million years old in terms of evolution, in the future we might discover even more mysteries about these creatures and discover something else we didn't expect. But for now, it looks like this is the strangest discovery, in biology at least, of 2020, and it's very likely we're going to be hearing about Heneguia salmonicola once again, once we discover what's going on here. But until then, and until we learn more, that's really it. 
Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about some of the more recent studies in regards to protecting humans and I guess in some sense other life from various dangers of space travel and more specifically about this really interesting study involving this really strange fungus from Chernobyl that seems to thrive in radiation conditions and might help us survive space as well. So when it comes to space travel, and in some sense even airplane travel, radiation can be a real concern, mostly because as you go higher and higher into the upper atmosphere and eventually space, you reach the area where there's a lot of various cosmic radiation, including of course cosmic rays, that bombard our planet and create relatively dangerous conditions. Now anyone living on the International Space Station that you see right here um, are obviously in quite a lot of danger from this, but because we've been actually doing this for um, over a decade now and we've been studying radiation and we've also ran a lot of different experiments, we know that we still have a lot to learn about radiation. But at the same time, back in 2016, the scientists from the University of Southern Carolina used the perfect opportunity to launch an experiment to the International Space Station on top of the uh, SpaceX Dragon um, capsule right here. And the main purpose of this experiment was to see how eight different fungi would react to the radiation produced in outer space. But honestly, we didn't even have to launch this mission because only a few years later, the scientists also discovered a lot of mold just naturally growing around the space station. This was a picture taken about two years later, and you can see this mold growing inside the ISS capsule, suggesting that various fungi will definitely thrive in space. But the most interesting part of this mission was that two of these fungi were the fungi originally discovered in Chernobyl back in 1991. Now this story you might have heard before, but it turns out that in certain areas around Chernobyl reactor, several different species of fungi were thriving. Not just surviving, thriving. Some of them became adapted to the high radiation conditions, and since then we've identified at least three main species. Today we refer to these as radiotrophic fungus or fungi, and for the most part the way they seem to survive in these conditions is by increasing the amount of the uh, component known as melanin. Melanin is of course something that we all have plenty of, and this is essentially the pigment responsible for skin color, hair color, eye color, and is even inside your brain. There's uh, three main different types of melanin. And the main benefit of having this unusual molecule in our skin and in our body is to protect from the UV radiation from the sun. This wonderful picture of a family from South Africa shows you how even in the same family people can have very different levels of melanin, which to some extent increases or decreases their protection from dangerous radiation from the sun. But it just so happens that melanin is also responsible for allowing these different fungi to thrive in Chernobyl. As a matter of fact, it seems that a lot of this fungus becomes almost entirely black, or at least much darker than before, and is then able to somehow use melanin for energy production. Now this is still a bit of a mystery to us, we don't really understand how it goes from essentially a molecule that's supposed to protect you from radiation to being able to use it for energy production, but generally speaking we know that the way that melanin usually protects our own skin and our own body is by essentially turning a UV radiation into heat. So essentially it absorbs the dangerous UV light and slowly transforms it into heat. And this allows the molecules to not be damaged. But it just so happens that once in a while, approximately one time out of a thousand, the molecule doesn't just produce the heat, it also produces an electron. And this could have been used by these fungi to start using melanin in the same way that the chlorophyll is used by plants to produce energy from typical um, light. So this is a pretty exciting discovery, and now that they've actually sent the fungi to space, they've also realized that it does seem to thrive there as well. So instead of using light like a typical plant, the fungi adapted to use what's known as radio stimulation to get all of their energy needs from radiation that would typically be pretty dangerous for human life. And the three main fungi we've discovered to be able to do this are this, this, and of course this. I'm being lazy here, I really don't want to try to read these names, mostly because, um, well, it's difficult. But also because I encourage you to go and read more about these fungi in your free time. But a much more recent study has now begun to test this even further. Specifically in November of 2019, the scientists from John Hopkins University, specifically these two wonderful people you can see on the screen, and about whom you can read more in the description below, decided to send another mission to the ISS, and this time not the fungi, but the melanin itself, the melanin extract 
mixed with polymers into this unusual substance that is now being investigated as a potential shield and a protection from various radiation in space. And the main purpose of this investigation, except for of course seeing how it protects um, different tissues and essentially humans in space, is to actually see if we can use it for other benefits as well. For example, energy production or energy storage. There's potentially a lot of different applications for melanin in space, and it could be that one little component that we need in order for us to successfully colonize different moons and different planets. The problem right now, of course, is that it's very, very expensive to produce, and so producing it artificially is not really an option, it's just too expensive. However, by combining these fungi right here, we can definitely find a way to have this fungus right here, or actually one of the three fungi I mentioned previously, to help serve our needs. And so even though the main purpose is to find a way for us to create a kind of a space sunscreen using melanin, at the same time we also want to find a way to harvest energy and to produce other things using the incredible Chernobyl fungi we discovered over two decades ago. And there is also a possibility that this will lead to some kind of a new technology using solar panels. Some of the components inside the solar panels might be eventually replaced with melanin and become even more effective at creating energy from basically sun and even outer space. Now the results for this study are not going to be available to us until probably summertime of 2020, but there is another study I wanted to briefly mention that has positive results in relation to protecting us from radiation in space. And surprisingly, the scientists whose paper you can find in the description below discovered that rust seems to do an amazing job at protecting us from really dangerous radiation as well. So it turns out that if we were to replace certain layers um, around, like for example a satellite shield, with rusty materials, or even better, cover a spacesuit with rust, it will dramatically increase the protection from radiation by about 300%. And ironically, rust is also cheaper than just regular metal. In other words, we can create relatively efficient, cheap and very effective shields for many different satellites, including of course the ISS itself. So covering the station with somewhat rusty material might have a lot of long-term benefit, even though it might not look that appealing. Now obviously not all metals and not all rust is created equal and the best effects were from this metal, gadolinium oxide, and the rust of this metal offered some of the highest protection we've seen so far. So in other words, all of this new research is exceptionally exciting, simply because we now have actual physical means of protecting ourselves from this really dangerous radiation in space, while at the same time this also creates an opportunity for us to now find a way to generate energy on objects like Mars slightly more efficiently by using melanin-based cells, while at the same time creating structures that will definitely protect humans from all kinds of dangerous radiation. And so in the next few years, hopefully we'll have our first prototypes of both the melanin-based and the rust-based shields, and also find really efficient ways to generate melanin using fungus from Chernobyl, thus saving a lot of money in the process. And this is something that I'm looking forward to learning about in the future. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and this here is Yoda. This is the recent addition to my family. You may have read one of my previous messages from a couple of months ago when I was actually trying to find a way to raise money for a dog charity where I actually adopted this little guy. But the thing is due to the coronavirus, unfortunately some of the plans had to be postponed, well technically indefinitely. I don't really know when I'm going to do the fundraiser yet and what exactly I'm going to do, but it's probably going to be something a little bit different from what I originally planned, which was essentially a big stream of various shelters here in Seoul and an attempt to raise some money for them. Okay, I think this is a little bit more comfortable for him. So anyway, what is this video about? Well, I still wanted to talk about dogs, and mostly because there are certain things that I've learned in the past few months from reading quite a lot of various papers from the dog experts learning about, well, essentially dog behavior. Okay, change of positions. He's getting a little bit heavy. And in a nutshell, as the title of this video says, we're going to be talking about love. So we're talking about the idea of love, and more specifically, the love of dog toward their owner. And this is something that I guess most of us kind of heard of but never really considered scientifically. Now obviously various pet owners will claim that their dogs or their cats love them, there's a lot of proof that they have, usually it's something to do with the behavior that they show, but scientifically speaking we could definitely explain it all away with just animal behavior. For example, a dog will obviously be attached to you because it knows that you feed it and it, you provide shelter. 
At the same time, we don't really even have a very good definition of what love is, but in the last few decades or so, a lot of scientific uh, studies have actually established at least one major component to how we can technically describe love scientifically, which thus allows us to establish whether dogs and other animals can actually love us or not. In other words, we can try to find a way to explain the question of can a dog love you? And at least one researcher from US has been doing quite a lot of different studies on uh, dog behavior and has recently even published a few books related to what he believes dog really feel. Clive Wine from Arizona State University is one of these experts that essentially published quite a lot of papers in the last few decades. And he does make quite a strong point in regards to dog love. So let's talk a little bit more about this. First of all, how do we even describe this so-called love? Well, modern science usually refers to love as hormonal response. And specifically here, we're talking about one hormone, the one you see on the screen. This is known as oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone that plays a lot of different roles in our social lives. For example, social bonding, childbirth, actual romantic dating, and it even helps mother produce milk in order to uh, then bond even more with their baby. It also actually has an effect on our behavior and does seem to produce more pro-social behavior, such as, for example, helping others, different types of romantic attachment, uh, different types of generosity, feeling trust towards someone, and of course, other pro-social behavior. So in a sense, this is the hormone that you can kind of use to describe extreme friendship, uh, friendliness, and of course, loving behavior. Some of the best studies actually come from uh, studying the reaction mothers have to their newborn children. And a lot of loving motherly behavior is always associated with much higher levels of oxytocin, whereas withdrawal, motherly withdrawal and depression is associated with much lower levels of oxytocin. So measuring this hormone can definitely allow us to quantify the so-called love. Well, it just so happens that some of the modern studies also discovered that our little furry friends, our canine friends, have a very similar oxytocin response when they see someone that they really love. And specifically here, we're talking about what you would call their owner, their human. They do seem to love their human and show this love hormonally. And this has also been tested quite thoroughly. For example, one of the experiments placed a dog um, in an environment where there was a bowl of food and their so-called owner, or their human, in the same room, at a relatively similar distance to each other. When the door was open and the dog was presented with a choice, without any exceptions, every single dog went for their human first and only after this proceeded to eat the food. In other words, dogs did show preference for seeing their human first before eating. In another study from 2003, scientists have actually learned that when you pet your dog or when people pet their dogs, the levels of oxytocin went up after about 20 minutes in both the dog and the owner. And the owner could obviously explain this by saying, yeah, I love my dog, but technically since the dogs can't speak, we can only use the hormone to try to explain what the dogs felt. Probably also the same feeling as their human. And when those studies were replicated in other conditions, every single time dogs seemed to actually exhibit this oxytocin response to the, well, source of their affection. And technically doesn't have to be a human either. Because in the last few years, we found at least one known case, and this was actually published here on BBC News as well, where the target of dogs oxytocin was not a human, but a penguin. And specifically, the penguin colony that the dog was protecting from all of the foxes that were trying to kill them. And even though it's pretty common for people to attribute this love or other emotions that are only technically human to animals, it seems that love does seem to apply to dogs, at least from the perspective of hormones. And the thing is here, we're not really talking about intelligence at all. We're not really talking about dogs being smarter than other animals because, for example, dolphins, they do possess a lot more intelligence. They're able to communicate using very complex grammar. They also are able to actually distinguish themselves in the mirror, which most dogs cannot really do. But we don't really know if dolphins can exhibit love. We do know that dogs can. But now the question becomes, how is that even possible? How can dogs and not, for example, wolves, which don't seem to exhibit the same effect, have this? And some of the recent studies were finally able to answer this. And to try to answer the question of how this is possible, we have to talk a little bit more about genetics and specifically a relatively uh, unknown disorder known as Williams syndrome. Williams syndrome is essentially a genetic disorder characterized by certain changes in appearance while at the same time, unfortunately, also causing certain uh, intellectual disabilities. 
Sometimes they're more severe than others, but in most cases, what makes Williams syndrome unique is how it affects the social behavior of people with this genetic disorder. Without exception, they all become extremely social, extremely friendly, and basically only wanting to be loved and to provide love to others. It's literally what you would call, and I know this is going to sound cheesy, but being a wonderful person. So in other words, it's one of the more unique and more unusual genetic disorders, with some of the people becoming relatively famous as well because of their friendliness. And the fun fact here is that the so-called legend of elves or these friendly creatures that used to exist in the Victorian era may actually have come from people suffering from this disorder back in the 1700s, 1600s, which is very likely where all of the elven mythology began from. So next time you hear about elves in any kind of fantasy books or movies, think of where it all started. But what do elves and people with Williams syndrome have to do with what we're talking about? dog love. Well, turns out that everything. It turns out that the same genes that affect people with Williams syndrome seem to affect dogs. Or in other words, dogs seem to be, well, wolves with Williams syndrome. Or at least a kind of a variant of that syndrome. And it seems to affect them in a somewhat similar way to the way it affects humans. They want to have a lot of love, they want to express love, and they want to be really friendly toward the whatever is their source of and target of affection. And all of these previous studies from the last years seem to show that really all that dogs want from us is to be with us and to be in our company. They don't really care about food as much as they care about us, neither do they care about so-called pack leader as many training uh, books teach us. They just want to have this feeling of oxytocin in their brain. They literally just want to have their social needs met and to show love and to be loved as well. And because this genetic component has been identified and actually tested and retested several times, it does seem to provide an idea that, well, all of this is genetic and hormonal. It's not just something that we attribute to dogs just because the way that we usually think about other animals. In other words, it seems that dogs evolved to be this way. In the last 8 to 10,000 years, their genes changed to have them have this unusual behavior that seems to be not really present in any other animal except for human beings so far. Or at least nothing concrete we've been able to identify in, for example, cats, dolphins, or so on. And because we believe that the purpose of oxytocin is to strengthen the social connections, we now definitely believe that it was actually this genetic component, this genetic disorder, that allowed dogs to express these feelings that they previously did not have. And interestingly, just like people with Williams syndrome, dogs are also extremely social, they want to interact with pretty much everyone, and they constantly appear all really happy. Something that their ancestors' wolves do not necessarily share at all. And what's more, a lot of these recent studies have also established that dogs seem to react much better to just being praised than to be fed. In other words, they don't really care about food just as much as we think they do. Instead, they want to be talked to, they want to be held, they want to be played with, and petted all the time. And this is something that was established using various MRI studies when the dogs were put in certain conditions and their brains were scanned to see if they responded in a certain way. So in other words, all of this is pure science. But we are still not entirely sure when all of this happened. We believe that it probably occurred about 8 to 10,000 years ago, but we don't know what caused all of these genetic disorders to suddenly appear. But there is a really important takeaway here, and that's in regards to how we train our dogs. All of these books that focus on us becoming the so-called pack leader or training dogs by being really strict with them are technically completely wrong. We should be doing the opposite. These funny bundles of joy only want to feel love and they don't want to be isolated. They want to be with you. And all your dog really wants is to make you happy as well. And this is something that we definitely need to remember next time we try to punish our dog for, for example, pooping on the floor, or chewing our favorite shoes, or stealing a cable and then destroying it. All of which just happened to me yesterday. But you know, those are all choices I made when I adopted this dog. So this is something I'm going to have to deal with for a while. Anyway, so hopefully now you know a little bit more about dogs and how they truly do love you, scientifically speaking. And if you're not a dog person and more of a cat person, well, I'll try to find something about cats, but so far it seems that they are kind of the opposite. Exhibiting more of an evil not-love hormone, which I'm gonna have to do some research on.
Anyway, on that note, thank you so much for watching, hopefully you enjoyed this video and hopefully in the next few weeks I'll finally be able to organize some kind of a fundraiser, but if not, I'll make sure to do this sometime in the summer when the whole virus thing goes away. And whether you have a dog or not, I thought that this is something important. I thought that this is something that most of us really need to be aware of, considering that dogs are technically the second most common pet after cats. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about a very exciting discovery that might allow us one day to generate energy out of air. And this could also be one of the most exciting energy related discoveries of the past few decades. So this is honestly one of the more exciting papers I've seen in the last few years and it's mostly because of what's involved in it, how long it took for us to get here and most importantly the potential applications this could have in the future. So first of all, let's discuss what's going on here and what exactly this is all about. Over three decades ago, this wonderful person by the name of Derek Lovely accidentally discovered a new type of a bacteria in a river in US, and this is today known as Geobacter. Geobacter are essentially a very exciting type of a protobacteria or these ancient bacteria that are able to do quite a lot of things really well. In the last few years, we've already discovered how this unusual bacteria can quite easily oxidize a lot of somewhat dangerous materials, like for example a lot of radioactive metals, a lot of things like petroleum compounds or even just regular organic matter and it can then transform it into CO2 or carbon dioxide by using a very special reaction using um, iron oxide. In other words, this is a very useful bacteria for um, environmental reasons, it can easily clean up a lot of different environments. But apart from biodegradation, we also discovered this bacterium is actually able to produce what's known as nanowires. Here's an image of a geobacter with the very conductive nanowires that were produced through genetic modification. And what this essentially means is that we modify the bacterium to produce the kind of really really tiny wires that would be useful for humans. In this case we use the bacterium's machinery to then produce these genetically modified cables. And not just any cables, but cables that are really conductive. And realizing this, for the past decade or so, a lot of scientists started to study this in a little bit more detail, but more specifically, a lot of various studies tried to investigate if we can actually use this bacterium as a kind of an energy source. Like, for example, we could maybe use these bacteria to generate energy out of organic waste. This has been actually previously shown to work, but we haven't really been able to generate anything that would be either practical or easy to maintain. But when it comes to the so-called microbial electrogenesis, the bacterium discovered by Dr. Lovely, the so-called geobacter, is essentially the master of this unusual phenomenon. As a matter of fact, if you were to ever order any kind of an educational resource kit where it teaches you about bacteria and how bacteria generates electricity, geobacter is always the sample that's included. And so it was really only the matter of time, and for Derek it was basically roughly around 33 years, before finally something was discovered that allows us to generate electricity out of nothing. And in this case, it generates it out of air. So this recent paper that was just published in Nature magazine essentially discusses and investigates the multidisciplinary discovery by Derek Lovely and another researcher from University of Massachusetts, Jun Yao. Both of these researchers actually work in completely different disciplines. We have a microbiologist and an expert in electrical engineering. But having combined forces, they decided to create a device they now refer to as AirGen which in a nutshell is a microfilm filled with these nanowires created by the Geobacter bacterium. And through sheer luck, it turns out that it also generates electricity, which like a lot of things in science was a completely accidental discovery. And it doesn't just generate electricity if you put something in it or if you um, add something to it, it seems to generate electricity if you just leave it lying around. And unlike previous attempts that used similar nanowires to try to generate something and only lasted for maybe a few seconds, here the researchers were able to generate electricity for several hours and, as a kind of approval concept, were also able to power an LCD that simply said hello UMass. In other words, they were able to generate electricity out of air, just like as the title says. But what exactly is happening here and how does this even work? Obviously this is not really getting air out of nowhere. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, it has to come from somewhere. And in this case the scientists are almost convinced it comes from the moisture in the air. More specifically they actually believe what's happening here, although it's still a bit of a hypothesis, their explanation comes from the phenomenon known as self-ionization of water. 
which refers to the idea that water molecules can kind of create charge by themselves. Some water molecules can become a little bit more negative, some water molecules become a little bit more positive. In a nutshell, it sort of works like this. And as these slightly more negative or slightly more positive water molecules interact with the actual nanowires that were created by the bacterium, they start transferring these charges into the wires and this starts generating a little bit of electricity. In other words, as long as there are ionized water molecules and as long as there is an actual difference between the positive and negative charge, this allows the bacterial biofilm to start transferring charge and thus generate a little bit of electricity for at least a few hours. And here you can even see how much energy they were able to generate with this first prototype. It generated approximately half a volt of electricity with the current of about 1200 nanoamperes, which is actually really, really, really small. This is about 2000 times less than what you get in your cell phone charger with the voltage level of about 10 times less as well. In other words, you would need to have a much larger device just to charge your cell phone. But nevertheless, this is just a first prototype and of course just a proof of concept. In other words, we still need to do a lot more work before we're able to generate some sort of a bacterial mega battery that can actually create enough electricity for the whole city and the whole planet. We're still far from that. Nevertheless, what's already been discovered is really impressive. So first of all, this is completely clean energy. There is absolutely nothing you need to add into the battery. It works completely just out of moisture from the air. It's also extremely low cost. The bacteria will generate these nano uh, wires really easily and quite fast as a matter of fact. And unlike other nano wires that usually require relatively expensive and also very polluting techniques to produce, these nano wires are made entirely by bacteria with just a little bit of genetic modification, which is not difficult for us to do anymore. Also, according to the scientists, this process seems to work inside, outside, even possibly in Sahara Desert where the humidity is relatively low and does not require sunlight or anything else. The bacteria are anaerobic, meaning that they don't require oxygen and can survive in relatively hostile conditions. So in that sense, this is almost like a perfect battery that we've been waiting for to discover for a very, very long time. And even though technically right now the amount of power generated is really, really little, this could already be used in various applications for all kinds of devices around us. The scientists have even suggested that you could technically paint your walls with this material and then generate enough electricity for the whole house just by having enough moisture in your house. This is of course really, really far away from being an actual reality just yet, but it's possible. And the scientists also mentioned that one of the first proofs of concept is going to be to find a way to generate electricity for a smartphone or even creating a battery entirely out of these nanowires that can be put inside a smartphone to charge it automatically by itself. In other words, imagine having a smartphone that you never have to charge ever again. Although I personally can see a lot more practical applications that could be used for this technology. But I guess smartphones are cool too. But it's really inspirational to hear how many new techniques we've been discovering to generate energy in the last few years. Like for example, there was another paper just over a year ago that explored the idea of so-called solar panels, but in reverse. In other words, generating power just through darkness, through the release of energy in the dark. In a more recent study, the scientists also identified that you can technically generate energy using melanin, the compound inside our skin that essentially gives you 10. Melanin is a really interesting molecule and there's going to be another video about this where we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail, but essentially this is yet another unusual and very safe way for us to generate energy. So hearing stories like this kind of gives me a lot of hope for the future of science and of course for the future of humanity. Because I think we all agree that we definitely need to discover a new source of energy, hopefully sooner than later. This whole fossil fuel thing is not really working out for us anymore. And honestly, the sheer dedication that Dr. Lovely had to this beautiful bacteria for the past 33 years is actually really inspiring. Imagine studying something for over 33 years until you finally find a way to use this for something really useful to help humanity. So that's a lot of dedication. But anyway, I would like to actually learn more about this project as it goes along and hopefully in the next few years we'll have some sort of a device that even uses this technology. But for now, it's just a prototype. Don't get too excited, we're not going to have cities powered by this bacteria anytime soon and it's very likely that it's going to take decades before anything somewhat useful is actually made out of this. But until we discover what to do with this and until someone creates something useful, that's really it. You can check out the paper for this in the description below. You can also probably reach out to Dr. Lovely directly on his Twitter account. Although please don't bombard him with messages all at once because I think he might get a little bit upset. But anyway, 
On that note, thank you so much for watching. Let's cross our fingers and hope that someone creates something useful out of this. And until further discoveries, that's really it. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton. And today we're going to be talking about viruses again. Yeah, but actually something a little bit more different. Today, I wanted to investigate the idea of origin of viruses and some speculation that suggests that maybe viruses actually came from outer space. So the idea of viruses and bacteria coming from outer space is, of course, not new. This is what we refer to as panspermia, the idea that was originally proposed by this Greek philosopher slash early scientist known as Anaxagoras. And he's known for some really, really eccentric ideas. Some of them were actually correct. Like, for example, when he predicted that the Milky Way itself is actually a collection of relatively hot stars. And he was able to also conclude that the reason that the moon is so bright is because it reflects light from the sun. But not all of his ideas were correct. Although one of the earlier ideas that was really interesting is the idea of panspermia, which stands for all seeds. Pan means all, spermia means seeds. The idea that essentially life spreads itself across the universe, and back then they didn't really know how big the universe was to begin with, and he even went as far as to assume that the moon also was populated and had a lot of different life on it. And what's really interesting is that it wasn't really until early 20th century that we started to explore this idea again, and the scientist who kind of brought this back to attention was this Swedish scientist known as Svante Arrhenius. And although today there are some things that he's criticized for, He's also admired for the early ideas he proposed, including panspermia, and also he's technically the father of the idea behind greenhouse effect. He's essentially the chemist that proposed that the increase in emissions of CO2 across the planet would actually lead to the warming of the planet. And he was able to prove it really early on, even before we started talking about all of this decades later. And so this idea of panspermia, or transfer of various types of life across the universe, has actually been uh, around for quite a while. Most recently, one of the major books that was released that talks a little bit more about this is this right here. And even though these ideas have been actually refuted by the scientists uh, in the years past, it does sort of propose certain things that we still can't really explain. And more specifically, a lot of these ideas are surrounding the origin and the extreme diversity of viruses. We actually have no idea what viruses are, or more specifically where they came from, what their purpose on our planet is, and why they are so different from one another. In one of the previous videos, I showed you this beautiful art by David Goodsell that sort of interprets viruses as these really beautiful and somewhat unusual shapes with quite a lot of variety which is really true of them. The thing about viruses is that they seem to be extremely genetically diverse, to the point where we really have no idea why they are so diverse and why they are so different from one another. One of the most recent discoveries that happened approximately a few months ago and unfortunately was overshadowed by the COVID-19 pandemic was the discovery of this unusually large and extremely unique virus that we've never seen before. This was a virus known as Yarrow virus. Discovered in Brazil, this actually raised a lot of questions because we have never seen a virus where approximately 90% of all of the genome was completely new and has never really been seen anywhere in any of the organisms on the planet. Only approximately 6 genes here were actually similar to something we've seen before. Now, this is actually really strange because discovering something completely new like this, especially in modern age, is extremely rare. So where this virus came from and why its genes are so different is actually a mystery and makes absolutely no sense right now. Another really interesting investigation from a few years ago was this right here. Here the scientists wanted to find out how many viruses fall from the atmosphere, or I guess from the upper atmosphere, onto the surface of our planet. They didn't really speculate about their origin, but what they've discovered is that approximately 800 million viruses fall onto a single square meter or about 3 uh, feet on the planet every single day. And that is a lot of viruses coming from nothing but just the atmosphere itself. And although we knew that viruses exist in the atmosphere, we just didn't realize it was so many. So once again, where exactly are these viruses coming from in the atmosphere? If they're being picked up by things from the ground, then we need to investigate how this mechanism works. Otherwise, we're still not really sure where all of this is coming from. And so here we have so many questions. Questions of diversity, questions of their origin, and of course, questions of why there's so many of them. Also, in the last few years, we've been discovering a lot of strange things in our own genes. 
As you may have learned from one of the previous videos, our genes possess a lot of viruses. About 8% of our genetic code of you and me is basically viral DNA. With some of these viruses being absolutely essential for our survival and reproduction, one of the more interesting papers from the last few years was a paper that discovered that a viral DNA is actually a part of the genetic code that's responsible for turning certain neurons in such a way that it's possibly responsible for our consciousness. So, in some sense, this implies that viruses also might be responsible for what gave us an ability to think and understand. So, all of this together suggests that these unusual, well, not really creatures, not really life, because we don't think of viruses as life, I guess you can call them chemical substances, these things, are part of us and are an integral part of us. They're basically the building blocks of everything that's in us and that made us the way we are. And that is really mind-blowing. So this also once again brings us back to the question, where did they come from and what created them? And this is what we have absolutely no answer for. Everything we've studied so far suggests that the viruses actually might be the origins of life on the planet and their origin might have extraterrestrial links. Now, this is where I'm going to have to say that we kind of don't know if they're actually from outer space. We have no evidence so far that they did come from outer space, but we do have evidence that we've discovered a lot of things in asteroids already. And some of these things could technically form a virus. So we found, for example, things like ribose, which is responsible for RNA. We've discovered amino acids. We've also found a lot of other materials that are organic and technically could be able to uh, produce somewhat simple organic molecules. But we've just never really found a virus itself. And the only mission to date that has ever attempted to actually prove all of this has not really given us any results yet. So let me briefly talk about this mission. This was originally started by JAXA, which is basically like NASA, but in Japan, and they created this mission known as Tanpopo. Tanpopo is essentially a dandelion. The idea is pretty simple. They wanted to see if panspermia has any merit, if viruses and bacteria indeed came from outer space. And to try to prove this, they basically placed this collection sample made out of gel in uh, outer space, in the International Space Station, and left it there for approximately three years. In February of 2018, the samples were returned back to Earth, but unfortunately there hasn't really been much report about these samples or really about any findings. And normally when this kind of stuff happens, it kind of means that maybe they actually botched the samples. Maybe they accidentally contaminated the samples on the way back or something else occurred. But there was at least one major discovery coming out of this mission that was published uh, back in 2018. They've discovered that the samples that were set in a gel, and specifically here they used several fungi to see how they would survive outer space, survived in outer space much, much longer and were able to sustain themselves for much longer period of time than they anticipated. And the initial results suggested that if the yeast was actually clumped together into a larger chunk, it had a much higher chance of surviving the outer space, which of course suggests that panspermia theoretically is absolutely possible, at least for yeast and in larger chunks. And this obviously does not suggest that bacteria and viruses could possibly survive as well, or that they could uh, propagate through space. It doesn't really change the fact that the um, life in space is a lot more resilient than we originally thought. Which is of course why I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the results from this mission, because it's definitely one of the more exciting discoveries that could probably explain a lot more about our own origin as well. And although generally speaking, for bacteria to survive in space it would be a lot more difficult due to the complexity and due to the fact that there's just a lot more damage that can be done to it, viruses on the other hand do have a higher chance of survival in outer space conditions, especially if they're protected by something. Some of the previous studies discovered that if you were to cover viruses in carbon molecules, for example, they would actually not be affected by the UV light. So there are a lot of ways for viruses to survive outer space conditions and possibly even for millions and millions of years. And so what does all of this mean in a nutshell? Well, right now we really don't know where viruses came from. We know that they are part of every single life species on the planet. They're part of bacteria, for example, that you see on the screen. They've also been found in the genome of everything on the planet we've looked at so far. So this does suggest that they were basically the building blocks of life on the planet. And even though we've found a lot of viruses in even upper atmosphere, we don't truly understand where they originally came from. The only mission to date has not really given us any conclusive evidence just yet, so we cannot certainly say where they came from, but this could be one of the more important questions that we could be asking when it comes to the origin of life on our planet. So far, all of the signs point at viruses, 
viruses could be what created life to begin with, they also seem to be responsible for the evolution and the complexity of life on the planet, and even though some of them are parasites and will actually cause sickness in us, most of them are not. Most of them seem to be beneficial to us. Okay, beneficial might not be really the right word. Essential to life. And if you'd like to learn more about how they affect our genetic code, you can check out one of the previous videos I made about this. And so if we combine all of this evidence together, what we discover is that viruses are the building blocks, they came from unknown origins, they are seem to be quite diverse and some of them we've never even seen before, so they do have relatively recent origin from somewhere else, and at the same time we've found quite a lot of viruses in the upper atmosphere as well. Now unfortunately so far these are all circumstantial evidence, it doesn't necessarily mean that viruses are from outer space, but the majority of evidence suggests that maybe they are. And so hopefully in the next few years we'll hear back from the Tanpopo mission and we'll find out once and for all if any of the viruses and bacteria were actually captured approximately 400 kilometers above the surface of Earth in the International Space Station. If the Tanpopo mission comes back with positive results, then there is really no reason for us to doubt panspermia or that viruses did indeed come from outer space and were probably created in various asteroids around the solar system. But as of today, as of right now, I'm gonna have to say that we still are not sure. We don't know. We really don't. 